talk about one of the most pervasive beliefs in the general society about the nation of Islam, and that is that it is an organization dedicated to the use of violent means to attain its goals. The question I have is, how true is this, and why do you think it persists in society? Well, the, the Muslims who have accepted the religion of Islam and follow the religious guidance of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad have never bombed any churches, have never murdered any little girls, as was done in Birmingham, have never lynched anybody, have never at any time been guilty of initiating any aggressive acts of violence during the entire uh, 33 years or more that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has been teaching us. The charge of violence against us actually stems from the guilt complex that exists in the conscious and subconscious minds of most white people in this country. They know that they've been violent in their brutality against Negroes. And they feel that someday the Negro is going to wake up and try and do unto them as they have done unto, do unto the whites as the whites have done unto us. We aren't a violent group. We do, uh, we are taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to be, to obey the law, to respect everyone who respects us. We're taught to display courtesy, to be polite. But we're also taught that at any time, anyone in any way uh, inflicts or seeks to inflict violence upon us, we are within our religious rights to retaliate in self-defense to the maximum degree of our ability. We never initiate any violence upon anyone. But if anyone attacks us, we reserve the right to defend ourselves. So to accuse us of, of being violent is like accusing a man who is being lynched, who is being hung on a tree, uh, simply because he struggles vigorously against his lyncher. The victim is accused of violence, but the lyncher is never accused of violence. I would like to uh, make a statement uh, concerning guns in the light of the assassination of uh, Kennedy. Uh, first of all, our position on guns and violence in general, on war in general, is one of uh, being against war and being against violence. And uh, this is not a change position. Uh, if it seems uh, in contradiction to some of my other, uh, earlier statements, it's simply because uh, people have not understood uh, what I was saying in the first place. That um, I say that violence, uh, war, and guns are a thing that the Black Panther Party uh, would like to see gotten rid of. That we absolutely. Um, are, are against uh, people uh, uh, killing each other and committing violence on each other. But also, we recognize that we're, we don't uh, advocate that the oppressed people, that the victims, uh, leave themselves uh, uh, subject to the aggressions of the criminal. And these are the people who are forcing uh, uh, us to a state of subjugation and uh, 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 keeping us in a state of slavery. And this is the people all over the world. Uh, for instance, uh, I'm sure the Vietnamese people uh, would like uh, very much uh, for uh, this government uh, to give up its guns. Because that would mean that the uh, military would disarm itself and stop killing little Vietnamese children and women and destroying them. Uh, I think I stated earlier uh, that our, the motto of the Panther is that uh, we're advocates of the abolition of war. We do not want war, but war can only be abolished through war. And in order to get rid of the gun, we find it necessary to take up the gun. So the first thing uh, to do is not to disarm the victim, but uh, disarm the aggressor. 
disarm the person who's first causing the violent incidents. Uh, the United States have been uh, visiting uh, uh, violence upon the world or causing violence upon the world uh, for years upon weak, oppressed people and that we are against this and uh, we would like uh, for this to be changed and we are going to uh, change it by any means necessary. So therefore, that uh, in the final analysis, that we would like for total disarmament to exist, but first we would have to disarm the cause of the disturbance. And the cause of the disturbance is U.S. imperialism and the violence that, uh, that um, is, um, the violence uh, that is in this country is only a reflection of the violent nature of the country in the first place. Uh, you don't expect to uh, go to someone else's home and uh, disturb things and uh, act violently and expect for your home to stay in a state of peace and tranquility. Uh, the first thing you have to do is stop your actions against other people and then violence will stop. But I think this country is so hung up on violence and ruled by force, the club, and the gun until it will be very difficult for them to even pass uh, legislation uh, to get rid of guns. And if they do pass legislation to get rid of guns, that the Black Panther Party is going to keep an eye on who maintains his guns. Uh, if they uh, want to disarm people, I would say first start disarming uh, the vicious uh, uh, police force that uh, occupy our communities throughout the country, where we die, uh, we're brutalized each day, and we're shot down in the street. Our little kids are shot down in the street by criminals with guns uh, under the skies going on the facade of peace officers. So, in the final analysis, that uh, we stand for total uh, disarmament, and this is not to exclude anyone. If you're going to disarm, then disarm. The police start with the police and end up with the uh, military, and uh, then that we would uh, advocate that all other countries disarm itself, and violence will stop. Uh, because then the people will have more of a chance of a redress of grievance because the racist and the imperialist will not be protected by his guns. That is the only thing that protects him is guns. So the violence that, uh, that America inflicts throughout the world is now coming home to roost, as uh, Malcolm uh, uh, said before his death. That, uh, that when uh, Kennedy's brother was killed, he made the... Uh, 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 statement of the chickens have come home to roost and uh, I think that uh, this is an appropriate statement at this time that uh, the yeah, but the question is more how do you get there do you get there by confrontation violence oh is that the question you were asking you know. see that's I mean that's another thing when you talk about a revolution most people think violence um, without realizing that the real content of any kind of revolutionary thrust lies in the, in, in the principles and the goals that you're striving for, not in the way you reach them. On the other hand, uh, because of the way this society is organized, because of the violence that exists on the surface everywhere, you have to expect that there are going to be such explosions. You have to expect things like that as reactions. If you are a black person and live in, 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 in the black community all your life and walk out on the street every day seeing white policemen surrounding you, I, when I was living in Los Angeles, for instance, long before the situation in, in L.A. ever occurred, uh, I was constantly stopped. No, the, the, the police didn't know who I, who I was, but I was a black woman and I had a, had a natural and, and they, I suppose, thought that I might be a, quote, militant. And when you live under a situation like that constantly, um, uh, and, then, and then you ask me, you know, whether I approve of violence. I mean, that just doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, whether I approve of guns. I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, some very, very good friends of mine were killed by bombs, bombs that were planted by racists. Uh, I remember it from, from the time I was very small. I remember the sounds of bombs exploding across the street, our house shaking. I remember my father having to have guns at his disposal at all times because of the fact that at any moment uh, uh, someone we, we might expect to be attacked. The 
man who was at that time in con complete control of the city government, his name was Bill Connor, uh, would often get on the radio and make statements like, uh, 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 niggas have moved into a white neighborhood, uh, we better expect some bloodshed tonight. And sure enough, there would be bloodshed. Uh, after the four young girls who were, who lived very, who lived, one of them lived uh, next door to me. Um, I was very good friends with the sister of, of another one. My, f my sister was very good friends with all three of them. My mother taught one of them in her class. My mother, in fact, when the bombing occurred, one of the mothers of, uh, one of the young girls called my mother and said, uh, can you take me down to the church to pick up uh, Carol? I, you know, we heard about the bombing, and I, and I don't have my car. And they went down, and what did they find? They found limbs and heads strewn all over the place. And then after that, uh, in my neighborhood, all of the men organized themselves into an armed patrol. They had to take their guns and patrol our community every night because they did not want that to happen again. I mean, that's why when someone asked me about violence, uh, uh, I just, uh, I just find it incredible, it, because it, what it means is that the person who's asking that question has absolutely no idea what black people have gone through, what black people have experienced in this country since the time the first... Of, I guess we could start with 1956 for our generation. This was the beginning of the rise of Dr. Martin Luther King. Dr. King decided that in Montgomery, Alabama, Black people had to pay the same prices on the buses as did white people, but we had to sit in the back. And we could only sit in the back if every available seat was taken by a white person. If a white person was standing, a black person could not sit. So Dr. King and his associates got together and said, this is inhuman. We will boycott your bus system. Now understand what a boycott is. A boycott is a passive act. It is the most passive political act that anyone can commit, a boycott. Because what the boycott was doing was simply saying, we will not ride your buses. No sort of antagonism. He was not even verbally violent. He was peaceful. Dr. King's policy was that nonviolence would achieve the gains for black people in the United States. His major assumption was that if you are nonviolent, if you suffer, your opponent will see your suffering and will be moved to change his heart. That's very good. He only made one fallacious assumption. In order for nonviolence to work, your opponent must have a conscience. The United States has none. 